Welcome again to Camp Hope Amy Church, located at 114 Camp Hope Church Road, Macon, Georgia, 31211. I am Reverend Dr. Michael L. Martin, amen, the pastor, amen, and the one who will be studying with you again this Wednesday, that we might study to show our self-approval, work need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And we're going to be coming from Numbers, Numbers chapter 27, Numbers chapter 27. So I'd ask that you get your Bibles out now that we can begin our study. And while you're doing that, amen, we are going to go ahead and do our prayer where we can get right into the study. Again, that's Numbers, Numbers chapter 27. Amen. Numbers chapter 27. Lord God, we just thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. For you are truly worthy to be praised. Thank you for another opportunity, God, that we might come to study to show our self-approval work beneath. Not be ashamed, Lord. And Lord, if we've done anything in thought, word, and deed that would hinder you from coming, forgive us right now. Forgive us in the name of Jesus, Lord. Let the Holy Ghost come. Let the Holy Ghost teach. Let the Holy Ghost give us revelation. This is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, Numbers, Numbers chapter 27. And let us read. The daughter of Zephlo, Prehad, son of Hepher, the son of Gilead, the son of Mark, uh, Makar, the son of Manasseh, belonged to the clan of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of the daughters were Mala, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza. They came forward and stood before Moses, Eleazar, the priest, the priest the leaders, and the whole assembly at the entrance to the tent of the meetings and said, our father died in the wilderness. He was not among Korah's followers who band together against the Lord, but he died for his own sin and left no sons. Why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he had no son. Give us property among our father's relatives. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord said to him, what Zelophehad's daughter are saying is right. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Say to the Israelites, if a man dies and leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, give his inheritance to his brother. If he has no brother, give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, give his inheritance to the nearest relative in his clan that he may possess it. This is to have the force of the law for the Israelites. Again, this is to have the force of the law for the Israelites as the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, go up this mountain in the Abram range and see the land I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. But when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my commands to honor me as holy before their eyes. These were the waters of Mikbad, Kadash in the desert of Zin. Moses said to the Lord, may the Lord the God of who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and to come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. So the Lord said to Moses, 
take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership, and lay your hand on him. Have him stand before Eleazar, the priest, and the entire assembly, and commission him in their presence. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. He is to stand before Eleazar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of the Uram before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out and at his command, they will come in. Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Aaron and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. Then he laid hands on him and commissioned him as the, as the Lord instructed through Moses. I read to you Numbers chapter 27, amen, verses 1 through 22. Numbers chapter 27, uh, verses 1 through 23, through 23. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be unto God. Let's get right into this. Now, in verses one through five, it's talking about the request of Zolophead's daughters, who he had died, amen, and his daughters, you know, were coming before Moses to, to talk about uh, having their father's name be a part of the tribe and go on and for them to be allowed to have inheritance. In Israel, as in all ancient Near uh, East, land was normally passed on from father to the son, not to the daughters. Because of this principle, there was a question regarding uh, the daughters of Zelophehad, whose father had no son. This issue is um, presented here because at the end of the previous chapter, the distribution of the land of Canaan was in view. You go back and read Numbers chapter 26, starting at, uh, I believe, 52 through 56. It was natural, of course, for his daughters to wonder well, where, what their place would be in the coming allocated land. Uh, though women did not normally find uh, 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 economic security, Apart from a husband's holding their land inheritance, a woman would typically at this time would have a diary from her father as a wedding present. Usually the father would require a potential son-in-law to, to provide much, if not all, of this particular diary to make sure they were taken care of. It was, it was thought that the diary could help provide for the woman if her husband left her or if he died unexpectedly. But the women were before Moses, and you know yet yeah, why? Why should the name of our father be removed among his family? This was how his daughters presented their issue to Moses. Without sons to inherit his land and, and, perpetu and, and perpetuate his name, there was a sense in which denying inheritance to only uh, the descendant, his descendants was to erase his name out of the history, out of the history of Israel. When there were sons born to a family, a father's property, of course, was divided uh, between his sons after his death. The eldest son, of course, would receive twice as much as the other uh, sons or his, his other brothers. Now Moses didn't make a decision on his own. He, he he saw the complexity of the situation. Moses Moses uh, uh, when faced with this situation, he went straight to God. Okay, God, what is it? What is your will and what is your way in this situation? And that's what we all should do. Always go before God when decisions need to be made, especially when there are serious decisions that's going to affect lives. We must go consult with the God and let God give us uh, an answer. You know, for in this particular case, it was a hard case. Why was it a hard case? Because 
you know, the way the custom was, the custom was daughters had to marry somebody. So God, so Moses, instead of making this decision, he went before God. And though their plea seemed reasonable, yet Moses showed his humility. He showed his, his, his modesty that he would not determine it himself without God's particular uh, direction in this particular decision he was about to make. Because he could have now, because he was the leader, they would have followed him, but no. Moses said, that is not my place, that is my not, not authority. I'm not gonna make a precedence, precedence here. If it's gonna be made, it's gonna be made by God because these are God's people. All right, verses six through 11 talks about, of course, the, the settlement of the inheritance of, uh, of the daughters of Zalathehad daughters to see what did God say? How was this going to be dealt with? But God seemed pleased. He seemed pleased that the daughters uh, brought this issue before Moses. God declared, and he just declared for him, he, he declared for the whole nation uh, of Israel. God declared that if, if, if a father had no son, the inheritance of their father could then go to their daughters. This was new. This was a new tradition, but it was not set by Moses, of course, it was set by God. Allowing daughters to inherit where there were no sons in the family created another problem, though. When they married, they would take the family land with them thus destroying the father's estate. To deal with this, however, we're going to read in Numbers chapter 36. Just write it down because we're going to talk about it. It will bring in additional rules uh, governing the marriage of, 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 of those who are or, or inheritance of their father's land. But, G, but, but God told them, this is how you're going to do it. I'm going to exactly tell you exactly what to do. If there were no daughters, after there was no son, the inheritors then went to the father's brothers. So it didn't automatically go to the brothers. First, he went to the daughter. If he had no sons, it went to the daughters. Then if he had no daughters, then it went to the father's brothers. If there was no brothers, the inheritance went to relatives close to him in the family. In other words, it stayed in the immediate family, the closest family uh, to them if he didn't have any bro bro sibling siblings or, or children, it still stayed in the family. And then uh, God told Moses, he said, give them. In Hebrew, it is uh, of the masculine gender to show that women in this case should enjoy the man's privilege and that the heavenly uh, Canaan, whereof uh, this was a type, did belong no less to women than it did to men. So God wasn't just giving the land to, the, to men, he was giving it to women, men, and women. The law was made in, in anticipation, uh, in faith of the coming of the inheritance of the land in Canaan. This was only an issue for the daughters because they were women of faith. God said it, we believe it, so we want to have our part in it. Who really believed in Israel that God would allow Israel, of course, to uh, possess the land of Canaan. This was also relevant because Israel had already begun the occupation of the land uh, east of the Jordan River, and their tribe, the, the daughter's tribe of Manasseh, would occupy some of those lands. Uh, these daughters were from Manasseh, so the allocation of their land may have come sooner than the allocation of the land for the tribe settling west of the Jordan River. So they was doing this at the right time, at the right place to ensure that they would be part of the inheritance from God. 
The case of these daughters further clarified the law of inheritance also again for the Israelites, as I said. First, if a man had no sons, they were first in line to inherit their father's property. That was a precedent set. Next, if a man had no sons, uh, next, if a man had no sons, his daughters would stand in the place of their son. That was another precedent. The other precedent, if there was no sons or daughters, the, inherited, the inheritance would pass to the closest family member, a brother, an uncle, or a cousin, or other, someone, the closest relative, not way out, but the closest relative. It would would inherit the land. All right, verses 12 through 14 talks about where God talks to Moses about what he did back uh, in Numbers chapter 20, amen, Numbers chapter 20, when he disobeyed God and, you know, struck the rock. Amen. Go back and read it if you don't read it again. So Moses was first told he would die before coming to the promised land. Again, like I said in Numbers 20, it was still many months until Moses would climb to the top of the mountain, able to see Canaan, but not able to enter it. And we're going to talk about it in a future chapter when we get in Deuteronomy. I believe it's in uh, chapter 34. So just check that out. After seeing the land, of course, Moses would die. Be gathered unto your people. That's what God told Moses. Now, when we look at in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verses 23 to 25, Moses explains that he did, on some occasion, ask God to, to relent from his judgment that Moses would never set foot in the land of Canaan. But God did not relent. And Moses made himself content with knowing he would see the land and be gathered to his God. So Moses didn't just say, okay, he did ask God, and God said no. God is not going to always say yes, amen. So we need to be prepared for God's answer to say no, and we should know that God knows best, that God knows what's to be done, amen? So Moses is to be gathered unto uh, his people. And the expression to be gathered uh, to your people describe the Hebrew concept of, of unity of and, 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 and identity with the faithful fathers. You know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, come on, with whom they would rest and find peace. Then it goes on and talks about uh, God uh, reminding Moses, say, look, I, uh, I know you want to uh, stay here and be in the land of uh, milk and honey. However, remember Moses, the reason why uh, you will not be allowed to indicate it is because of your sin, of misrepresenting me at uh, Meribah. And we can find that again in Numbers chapter 20, I think it's around uh, verses 12 and 13. So God reminds Moses, this is what you did. This is what I said. This is what's going to happen. And this is why I am doing it. Uh, verses 15 through 17 talks about Moses' response to God's announcement. All right. After hearing his coming, uh, coming fate, Moses did not try to change God's mind. And he did not complain either. His only concern was for the congregation of Israel, for the people, not for himself. True leader. Amen. True leader. Uh, this was a picture used to, to, when it talks about that the congregation of the Lord may not be like, like sheep which had no leader. This was a, a picture used to describe a leaderless people. Sheep without a shepherd are in, in, in constant danger. No one protecting them. No one guiding them in the right places. They, they, they have trouble finding food. They would have trouble finding water. And they would wander into dangerous places. 
God wants his sheep to have a shepherd. And we know our 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And the duty of shepherd was well understood. They were to feed. They were to lead. That's what it says, lead them out and bring them in. And they were to protect the sheep. Right? These last few verses, verse 18 to 20, 23, talked about Joshua being chosen, of course, and given the authority as uh, the leader. Though Joshua was not of the noble birth or a, 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 a legal son of Moses uh, or a literal son of Moses, there were many things that qualified him to be the successor of Moses. If we look back in history, we go back to uh, Exodus chapter 17, I believe, we see that Joshua had led the army of Israel against the Amalekites. So he had some experience. Exodus chapter 24, Joshua was also the assistant to Moses. All right, in Exodus chapter 20, uh, 33, Joshua helped Moses at the tabernacle after the golden calf disaster. Go back and read it. Also, Joshua was zealous to preserve the authority and leadership of Moses back in Numbers chapter 11, if you go back and read that. Also, Joshua was one of uh, the two faith-filled spies among the total of the 12 who spied out the land of Canaan. You can go back and see that again in Numbers chapter 13. Chief among all these qualifications was that Joshua was a man in whom is the Spirit. The Holy Spirit would empower and enable him to fulfill the challenging role of leadership of, and of leading the nation into Canaan. Now, the prayer was immediately answered when Moses said he would be the leader. And he had not only the satisfaction already referred to of appointing his successor, but was far more important to him that of knowing that the one so appointed was a man of God and of his own choice. This seemed to have been immediate from this point because God says, you shall give some of your authority to him. Not only did God choose Joshua, but God says, now you need to give some authority over to him. This seemed to have been immediate. Like I said, from this point, Joshua shared some of the authority of Moses in leading Israel. Until the passing of Moses, there was some much of shared leadership and responsibility. There was a brief transitional period. Praise God. Then God says, okay, this is how you're going to get him ready. Let him stand before Eleazar the priest. This appointment of Joshua was not only made evident by Moses, but also by Eleazar the priest. The priest would support Joshua's leadership, even though he, unlike Moses, did not come from the priestly tribe of Levi. The, the explanation of the role of Eleazar the priest would soon, uh, who shall inquire before the Lord for him, God says, he shall do this. It shall be Eleazar to do this. It indicated a difference in the place of Moses and in the place of Joshua. Whereas God spoke to Moses face to face. You see this in Numbers chapter 12. Joshua would be, would be instructed by Eleazar, the priest, who would use the Uram and the, and the Thunum, the sacred lot, to discover God's will and tell it unto Joshua. Also, he told them, now you're going to 
do this and give him the authority, not in secret, not just before uh, Eleazar, but you shall do this before the people. So this public presentation and laying on of hand of Joshua, it was extremely important. It presented Joshua before all of Israel as their next leader, the one whom they should expect to follow as God had appointed him leader. He didn't appoint himself. Moses didn't appoint him. God appointed him. And this needed to be known before the people. This authority needed to be established. Amen. I pray that you would go back and read over uh, Numbers uh, chapter 27. Amen. Numbers chapter 27. Read over it. Let the Holy Ghost speak to you through it. Amen. Give you some revelation and understanding. Remember, we here at Camp Hopes has a motto that says, come grow with us as we transform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds as we prepare for Christ's return. We pray that you have enjoyed the study. We pray that you will keep studying to show yourself approval. And we pray that you will tune in next week, Wednesday as we go through Numbers chapter 28. Read back over in 27, amen. Read 28 and let us come and study together, united as one, being led on by the Holy Spirit. Again, thank you for being here with us at Camp Hope Baby Church, located at 114 Camp Hope Church Road, Macon, Georgia, 31211. Love you with the love of Christ. And as I always say, see you next time. God bless you.